Hey everyone, welcome to week 39. We still don't have a setup to do the intro, so sorry, we're still moving in. Uh, the theme for this week is going to be grays. This is one of the things that I love the most about painting. So it's going to be really fun to explore all the ways that we can achieve grays within our painting practice. So let's see what we do today. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is Monday, this is a new week, new theme. And the theme for this week is going to be grays. Now, to be honest, this is probably my most favorite theme of the whole year. I mean, I can anticipate that it's going to be my favorite for the whole year, even though there's a bunch of weeks that we still have to do. But I have this, I don't know, otherworldly affinity towards grays. I gravitate towards them for no reason at all. I mean, I've tried to rationally understand why I love grayness so much. And I don't know, I have my hypotheses. Um, I think that I do not like the sun, you know, and I'm going somewhere with this, so bear with me. I don't like the sun. I don't think I was blessed with the skin, for example, that my beautiful sister was blessed with. She looks beautifully Latin. I don't. I actually take on my grandfather's side, my German grandfather's side. So I am a clear, transparent vessel. And for somebody like me living in Bogota, which is so up high in altitude, it's just a mismatch. You know, it doesn't really make sense. Because even when the skies are absolutely gray, even when there's not a hint of sun coming through the overcast sky, I get sunburnt. You know, I get really badly sunburnt. So that has been the history of my life, just sunburnt after sunburnt after sunburnt. I think that I kind of slowly, slowly became sort of indoctrinated into understanding that the sun is my enemy. It, it really is. You know how people love summer and they love to go out. First thing they want is to go to the beach. I don't. I think it's um, nature is out there to kill me. I think the sun is out there to just um, annihilate me and make my life miserable. So I actually just run away from it and say, yeah, I love to feel warm, but I can't be in the sun for like more than 20 minutes. It's just not going to happen for me. It's just not going to work. That is not the genetics I was given. That's my roll of the dice. I think that my people belonged to the uh, mountains, to the very cold mountains. We probably all lived in caves and we lived in manageable temperatures. Not too cold, but I can stand the cold. And for sure, not too hot. Just a very mild temperature. We were a mild people. I'm certain of that. And we ended up accepting our complete inability to handle sunlight. So I think that with sunlight, with this idea of sunlight, comes the idea of saturated color. The energy of the sun is the thing that provides bloom and blossom. We have these beautiful colors in nature trying to grab a little bit of that life energy that is sunlight. And because my tribe had to be sort of like a Grinch tribe and we had to deny ourselves the possibility to experience all these beautiful, you know, saturated colors, I think I grew accustomed to what surrounded me, which was grayness, browns and deep bluish grays and green grays. And I ended up loving those colors. So even though this is a very cool thing, Bogota is so high up in the mountains and the sun, the UV rays just do a terrible number on me. Bogota is by nature a very gray city. A hundred years ago, it was a city that people only understood as, as a rainy city. Like you would always take your umbrella out because it was bound to rain at any moment. So it would be comparable to, I don't know, London, Seattle, places that you would never associate with uh, sunlight. <laughs> so I think that even though nature is out to get me, I love the grayness of Bogota. I love the overcast skies. I love this white kind of silvery sky. I love that the foliage is not really super colorful. The greens of our trees are really kind of brownish greens, grayish greens. Um, I love that. And I think I've became incredibly sensitive to those 
tiny little changes that there are in grayness. And, you know, I've been talking for five minutes about how I'm afraid of the sun. And while it may seem facetious, um, I think there is some truth to it because I've been trying for the longest time to why I am a person that really dislikes saturation in color. And I do think it obviously has to do with my personality. I am a very introverted person, even though maybe it doesn't show. I'm a very shy person at my core. So anything that would draw attention to myself, I would avoid. Anything that would call attention upon me, I would just completely, completely avoid. So I've never worn like a bright yellow shirt or a bright red shirt. Anything that's saturated, I, I can't do. I don't do like a ton of colors in my sneakers, a ton of hues. If my sneakers are white, great. If my sneakers are black or gray, fantastic. I have black t-shirts or white t-shirts. I have gray hoodies, black hoodies. So nothing really that grabs your attention. And I think that because of that, because I am that person, because I have that personality, I think that when I started painting, I was absolutely horrified of saturated color. I felt super comfortable with doing grisaille or with doing umber underpaintings. I could do that and I was like, yes, this is beautiful. But as soon as I looked down at my palette and I would see, I don't know, cad yellow, cad orange, cad red, cerulean blue, um, I was like, oh my God, what, what am I going to do with these colors? I mean, I, I can't handle these colors. If I don't want attention drawn to myself, chances are I don't want a painting that draws attention to itself. And I think that that was the biggest obstacle that I had to overcome when I was dealing with color, when I was trying to understand myself as somebody who could have this aspect of color, this condition of color, this characteristic that's intrinsic of color, which is saturation, become part of my life and part of my language, that this was actually something that could aid me in trying to express myself. So instead of seeing it as something that was completely horrifying, I had to train myself and tell myself, no, these are your tools. This is like a really important aspect of your tools and it can actually help you. It can actually resolve issues for you. So it was very, very hard for me to come to terms with the idea that I could still be a very shy, introspective, introverted person and that I could still use color and understand color as something that was part of my voice. And by color, I'm saying color in its totality, using saturation as my tool. It wasn't easy, to be honest. It wasn't easy at all. And I think I made it a little bit easier to handle for myself when I told myself I am going to relearn everything I think think I know about color, which was nothing, to be honest, by eliminating my whole palette. Told you guys this story before, but just not throwing away because, you know, some of those colors were terribly expensive, but putting them aside and starting from zeros. What did it mean to start from zeros? Saying, okay, I'm going to start to think about color, but I'm going to do it, you know, in very simple, you know, easy ways that are manageable for me, that are kind of easy to digest for me. And every step of the way, I'm going to try to evaluate if I understand what I'm doing. And if I don't, I'm going to stay there for as long as I need to stay there. And only when I feel comfortable and confident enough to know that I can move further, that's when I'm going to start adding colors into my palette. So I started with black and white, titanium white and ivory black. And then I slowly added like umbers. You know, I, I, I remember adding raw umber, burnt umber, burnt sienna, uh, raw sienna, yellow ochre. And I slowly, slowly went from that earthy, earthy palette to a palette that had an accent in saturation. And that was my big move, just putting cad red into my palette and saying, okay, now I can do the mix of those two palettes with uh, that cad red, which is pretty much a Zorn four color palette. So I moved from grisaille to earth color palette to a four color palette. And then eventually... I started saying, okay, how can I understand my hues? Because basically my yellow ochre in that four color Zorn palette was my yellow hue. My cat red was my red hue and my ivory black was my blue hue. So it took a lot of effort for me to say, okay, I have to try and replace that black with a blue. And what blue can I put there that's not menacing to me? And of course, I landed on ultramarine blue, which is the blue I still have, you know, which is the blue that I still use and I still absolutely love. It was really, really weird for me this year 
this year to permanently, I'm going to say permanently, include a yellow hue, a yellow pigment different from yellow ochre and think of it as something that was now part of my palette, which is bismuth yellow. Bismuth yellow is a color that I've had on my palette for maybe, I don't know, two years now. It was on and off. Now it's like permanently part of my palette and it has kind of pushed away the yellow ochre. But if you really think about it, I mean, this kind of seems insane because I graduated in 99. I had to stop painting. By the way, when people feel weird about having to stop painting, I stopped painting. I mean, not, you know, full stop, but I literally did for the next three years of my life while I was working in New York uh, at an illustration studio. I did three paintings in those three years. Three paintings in three years. And it's not like, oh my God, you did a painting a year. It must be amazing. No, I did like a three, you know, medium to large size paintings that were super not complex. Trust me, it's not like they were the most preciously modeled paintings in the world. No, not at all. Not at all. These were very simple paintings, and I could only do three of them. I could only paint on weekends, maybe for a couple of hours on Sundays. So I was literally a Sunday painter. I hate that term, but I was literally a Sunday painter for three years. So for everyone out there that feels like, oh my God, every time I see somebody paint that's doing like a huge painting or that has a show and suddenly has 30 paintings that look incredible and that they've worked on for the past couple of years and you feel like, what the hell? You know, I've been just working on my sketchbook doodling for the past couple of months. I'm not doing anything. Don't ever feel bad. Don't ever, ever feel bad. Like art is going to wait for you. Painting is going to wait for you. And you know, as long as you just put some time, a tiny little bit of your life aside to work on your painting, to work on your drawing, to work on whatever you want to do, that's totally, totally fine. That is healthy. That is amazing. That's incredible. That's giving yourself a chance for painting or drawing or sculpting or whatever you're doing to give back to you. So don't ever feel weird. This is not about how much other people work. If not, I would have killed myself like so long ago because I noticed that I only work about 10% of what James Jean works. And he's insane. Like, I've never seen somebody work so hard in my life. That is just extraordinary. He is the most hardworking human being I've ever seen. And when I compared myself to him, I was like, oh, I'm nothing. I am absolutely nothing. I will never amount to anything. I can't work as hard as he does because I, I knew it. I accepted it like right from the start. Sometimes you meet people that push you and you're like, hell yeah, I want to work harder and I want to devote more time into this. And you're super pumped and you get home after, you know, having a talk with them or going to a show of their work or just visiting them at their studio. And you're like super psyched. Other times you meet people that you go like, oh, take a break, you know, uh, what are you trying to prove working so hard? And they make you feel horrible. You know, those people, they don't make you feel like pumped and psyched. No, they make you feel like you're nothing. Like, what have you been doing? You know, you're having a conversation with them and they're telling you about the 200 paintings they're doing at the same time. And meanwhile, you've been working on like a little drawing of a cow for the past couple of months. And you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to f figure out how to make the udders turn. And... I can't do it. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where I was going with this. I always go on tangents. So forgive me. So I graduated on 99. I stopped working for three years. So let's do the math. That's 2002 ish. So if you think about it, it has taken me from 2002 to 2020, 18 years to feel comfortable with putting a saturated yellow in my palette. And I would like to believe that in the past 18 years, I have painted like crazy, you know. I'm not going to say that I've painted every single day of every single one of those years. But I'm going to say that there hasn't been a week, maybe, you know, in those years that I haven't really drawn or painted. I have drawn or painted for the last 20 years incessantly, I feel. I know this for a fact because in my case, 
I don't feel comfortable if I don't draw or paint. Like I understand so many things while drawing or painting. So it's almost like a release for me to draw or paint. So 18 years of kind of constantly having painting and drawing as my companion of thinking that I'm pushing myself to try to understand my tools, producing you know, hundreds of paintings that I've done throughout the years to only now feel like I have the courage to say, yeah, you know what? And by the way, I feel like Superman when I'm saying this. I'm going to put bismuth yellow in my palette. What? What? <laughs> I mean, 18 years, that's crazy for me to say I, I am comfortable with saturation so that another hue in my palette can be saturated because Cad Red, I have no idea why I've been comfortable with Cad Red from the start. I'm sure that using it as my accent in saturation in the Zorn palette has something to do with that. But for example, with my blues, I've used, you know, I've used ultramarine blue forever. I mean, I think this year I changed it for cobalt ultramarine. And I thought I was very gutsy when I said, you know what? Let's just do cobalt. I mean, come on. I, it's a beautiful color. It's a very bright kind of saturated color, but it's nothing weird. It's nothing crazy. So I don't know. I mean, 18 years to put that yellow in. I have no idea like a cobalt teal? Oh my god, I'm going to be in the grave when I consider thinking that my blue in my palette is going to be a cobalt teal. I'm going to be in heaven. I don't need to paint anymore. All this dumb story just to say that I am a human being that has rejected or I don't know, let's not say rejected. I've been afraid. I have been horrified of using saturation in my palette. That's just the way it is. Um, that, that is my truth. So... What have I done throughout these years if I don't feel comfortable painting with these saturated colors? I paint with grays. I love grays. I love my grays. I absolutely adore grays. And what we're going to do this week is to try and understand the many ways, because I have done it in many, many ways, the many ways in which we can approach grayness, you know, within our palette. And the way we've been doing it throughout this painting today for our first day is a very simple one, but super effective. And I actually love it because it actually makes you think about having hierarchies in your palette and in your mixes. So what we're doing for today is using a natural neutral color, which I absolutely adore, which is my earth tone. You know, I've been weeding out earth tones throughout the years in my palette. And the one that I've kept is raw umber. I absolutely love raw umber. There's a ton of weird different raw umbers. Some of them are greener, redder, blacker. But if you don't get those that have this very perceptible hue in them, raw umber is a naturally gray neutral pigment. It does have a tiny bit of temperature once you start comparing it with other earth tones and other hues, but we're not off. We kind of think of it as a very naturally neutral color. It's not perfectly neutral. I'd say that uh, Castle Earth Van Dyke Brown is a far more naturally neutral color, but I love my raw umber. So what I'm doing today is I'm keeping my regular palette, which is titanium white, bismuth yellow, cad red, alizarin, raw umber, and ultramarine blue. But what I'm doing is something that's very, very simple. What I'm saying is, Okay, I'm going to use my whole palette, but, but I'm going to make every mix have my raw umber be dominant. So even if I'm introducing, you know, other hues, even if I'm mixing colors that are saturated, I'm going to mix them into this mix where my raw umber is dominant. So there's going to be a lot of raw umber in that mix and a little bit of those other colors. It's a very, very easy thing to understand. If we have a natural neutral color and we make that color dominant throughout our mixes and what it's going to do is that it's going to use its natural characteristic to neutralize the saturation in those other colors. So I absolutely love doing this. I love saying, yeah, I have an open palette. I have all these beautiful hues, but my raw umber is going to be my key color here. I'm going to mix everything with it. So hopefully, you know, if you take a look at my palette, 
you're gonna see that every single time I'm gonna feed all my mixes a little bit of that raw umber and that's gonna take them down a notch. So that's how we achieved grayness today and that's something that I'm super, super comfortable with because many times this is what happens with me. It's like I look at a color and I'm like, oh my God, that's a beautiful hue, but it's a little too saturated, but I still wanna use it. I can still use it knowing that I have raw umber at my side and I can always just gray it down naturally. Now, the cool thing about having an umber, having an earth tone that can gray your colors out naturally is that you don't shift your hue when you're graying your color. This is different than graying something out with complementaries because now you can maintain your hue. You know, it's not gonna shift. A red orange is not gonna turn purple or a yellow is not gonna turn green. So that's the coolest thing about graying out with a natural earth. So that was the intro for this week. It's basically a personal story of me just telling you guys, yeah, this is the reason I think that I'm horrified of saturation and this is how I've kind of dealt with it. So, so that was fun for today. Join us uh, tomorrow for Spanish Tuesdays, Martes Español. Remember, brush up on your Spanish where we are going to do something completely different and we're going to try to understand uh, grays in a very different way. Because what I would love to do for this week is for people to realize that gray is not just something that's black and white. We're going to expand that definition of grayness and we're going to look at possibilities in our palette that are going to aid us in trying to achieve very rich grayness in our painting. So. That's what we're going to try to do uh, during the week. So tomorrow, we're going to see if there are other alternatives that can help us solve this gray mystery. <laughs> so thank you guys for hanging out. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.